Welcome to Oil Painting Question and Answers, episode number eight. If you have any questions or comments for me regarding oil painting or painting in realism, uh, leave it in the comments of this video, and I'll get to as many of those questions as I can next week. Uh, and by the way, thank you so much for all the questions. I get some great ones, and I wish I had more time to answer more. Uh, but we simply don't have enough time, but I really do appreciate your questions, even if I am unable to answer them. Um, and what I want to do before we get to the questions and answers uh, is I want to give a little lesson on what I call the artist curse, and I didn't come up with that term. I, uh, another artist told me that years ago. But the artist curse is just something that where you are unable to enjoy your own work or you're unable to see your own paintings with a fresh eye or with the eye of somebody who's, who did not paint it. And it's, it's a very powerful thing and it's one of the most uh, hardest things for artists to understand or to overcome. It stops a lot of artists in their tracks. People who are great artists stop painting because of the artist curse. It's a huge deal. It's probably the biggest thing that I ran into in my workshops when I was teaching was the, the, it was helping artists or helping people overcome the artist curse. And so if you're going about painting and you, let's say you're using my method and you're checking your colors and you're laying in all your values like you should and you're doing everything perfect, as you paint the painting and as you progress, you, you do not see the magic. You do not see this beautiful pot or whatever it is. And let me just tell a few stories so you can understand just how powerful this is. And it'll happen to you. And when it happens to you, you won't even know it. Because when I used to teach, um, and this is going back from the very beginning in, you know, in 2000 when I first started teaching classes. And what I would do is I would tell people, um, you know, your painting will look wrong to you. As you lay in your colors, it's not going to look right, but you just have to keep going. And I would tell that, I would make the point as hard as I could, and sure enough, everybody gets home, they're working in their own studio, they're halfway through a painting, and they call up and they say, Mark, I don't know what's wrong with my still life, I'm doing everything that you've told me, I'm checking my colors, I'm laying them in where they go, but my painting just looks horrible. And I say, yeah, but I told you it would look horrible. And they say, no, no, you don't understand, it really looks bad, it's not, it, this isn't what you're talking about. And I go to their house or I go to their studio, and I look at their painting and it's fantastic. So far, so good. They've done everything right. And yet, they're looking at it and they're saying, I don't get it. It doesn't look right. Now, let me tell you another story. Uh, this was a uh, guy that used to work for me, uh, Ronnie Taylor. And he was, uh, I was teaching all my employees to paint. And he started on his painting. And he did his first painting. And I was out of town because I was always traveling uh, to meet clients for portraits. And so I was out of town and he did his first painting and I came back and it was horrible. He did a horrible job on it. He, the shadows were all wrong. It was, he blended everything up. He tried to, you know, basically tried to paint out of his head. And I said, Ronnie, you know, what's wrong? Did, did, did you not check your colors? Did you not look in the shadow? And, and, and you know, this is completely wrong. And he knew how to mix colors because he had done a lot, of, a, a lot of that, you know, working for me. And uh, so he said, well, I tried. I put in the colors like you told me to. I did everything he said, but it just looked horrible, so I had to fix it. Well, of course, he didn't fix it. He ruined it. And uh, so I told him, uh, so he did a, a, his second painting, and I had to go out of town again. So I left him, and I said, Ronnie, lay in your colors, check your colors, put them where they go. Do not blend. Just leave it alone, and, and do not fix. Do not try to pretty it up. Just cover the canvas, lay in your colors, spot by spot, leave it alone. So he did that. And he did it exactly as I told him to do it this time. So I come back from out of town, and he come, and I'm walking into the studio, and he says to me, Mark, and I hadn't seen the painting. He was already there, and I walked in, and I said, uh, he says to me, Mark, I, t I did everything you said. I laid in my colors. I didn't blend. I left it alone. I left it ugly. And look at it. It's horrible. So it didn't work. It, you know, your me the method just doesn't work. Well, this is the painting that he painted. And he was sitting there looking at this, and all he could see was ugly brushwork, ugly colors. He did not see these beautiful flowers sitting on marble reflecting. And that is the power of the artist's curse. It's so strong, you just can't believe it. 
Okay, let me tell you a, a, another story. This is um, uh, Susan Flanagan who took my workshop. And I think she was in my second class here in Austin when I started teaching again. And she finished her painting or was coming to the finish of her still life that she was working on. And she said, Mark, you know, I, I, I came here to Austin because I wanted you to teach me to paint. And this, this just isn't what I'm after. This is not the paint type of painting that I wanted to do. I really want, I wanted to take it to that level of realism that I love. And this just isn't it. Well, this is the painting that she painted. <laughs> and so, you know, I can, I can sit there and say, no, it's great. Look at it. Step back. Look at it from across the room. But, you know, a lot of that doesn't do any good because they are not seeing uh, a still life. They're not seeing the realism. They're seeing paint and they're seeing, you know, ugly brush strokes, whatever it is. There's something that flips in your brain. Karen West is another student of mine. She came to one of my workshops. She finished her still life. Same thing. Mark, I want to paint that real high realism that I, that I see. And this just isn't it. I don't like it at all. She was real frustrated. She felt like, you know, in, in a lot of ways that, you know, she didn't really come and, and learn what she wanted to learn in the workshop. And I was trying to break through this artist curse with her. So what I did was, she wasn't looking, I took a photograph of her still life, of her still life painting. And, you know, when you take a photograph with your camera and you don't set it up exactly right, the colors get shifted, the photograph is a little overexposed, so it looked different than real life, but it was just a change, something new for her to look at. So I took this picture on my phone, and then I walked up and I said, take a look at this. And I wasn't trying to trick her, I was really just trying to say, look at your painting from a different perspective. Look at it in this little photograph where it's slightly overexposed and it looks different, and maybe that'll spark something and you can see through it and see that, wow, this really does look good. But anyway, so I show her the picture on the phone and she looks at it and she says, now wait a minute, is that the still life or is that my painting? And she, for a minute, was thinking she was looking at a photograph of the painting, or rather a photograph of the still life itself instead of, of her painting, and it was actually of her painting. And that's just how powerful that artist curse is. When you can look at it and you're sitting there working on that painting for hours and hours and hours, you know, you just don't see it. And you, you, you look at it and you see paint. You see sloppy paint, you see colors, you don't see what you see in the museums. So it's really a powerful thing. Um, now, how to overcome the artist curse? Uh, one of the things that, that I tell people is, you know, you're never really going to be able to enjoy your work like somebody who had never painted it could. And that's the reality. You cannot change that in your brain. You cannot all of a sudden, you know, do wave a magic wand and, and then all of a sudden be able to appreciate your work. Um, so what you, you do is over the years or, you know, uh, months at least when you're starting and then years, you find people that are honest with you, whether that's your spouse or your brother or your, or your mother or whoever it is, somebody that will tell it like it is and maybe has an interest in art and you find those couple people and they can give you feedback and they can tell you, wow, this one is really good or this one is better than that one or wow, this is, and you, you begin to sort of get a sense and it's a different sense. It's not as if you can look at your painting and enjoy it. But you can look at it and say, yeah, I got my values right, and my, my drawing is good. Things are where they need to be. When I step back away from it a room's length and kind of put my eyes out of focus, it, it works. You know, there's all these little things that you do. But you're never, ever going to really be able to enjoy your work uh, as if you had never painted it. You know, perhaps if you had amnesia or something, I don't know. But anyway, it's just something that you have to live with. And, and by the way, there, there are people out there who don't have the artist curse, who love everything they do. And, and there's always exceptions to the rule. But let me just tell you, back when I, um, when I used to do portraits, I used to run these full page ads for my portraits in, in these uh, you know, magazines. And I would get a lot of the calls I got because I was charging such high prices, a lot of the people that called me weren't interested in having their portrait done. Um, or, or hired me to commission me to paint a portrait. They want to know if I taught art classes or taught how to paint. And there were two types of people that would come, and I'd always say, yeah, sure, come by the studio. You know, I could show you what I'm doing and maybe teach you something. And there were two types of people that would come. 
the one, the first type would come and they'd say, you know, I'm, I'm happy with my painting. I feel like I'm painting at your level, but I just need uh, advice on how to market my work and how to, you know, the business side of it. And could you come and, and help me with that? And they would come to my studio and they would bring all this work in and it was almost without exception. In fact, I can't even think of an exception. It was horrible. Colors were wrong. It was just this, you know, cartoony, whatever it was, it just did not, it, it, was, it was nothing like real high quality realism. And yet they thought it was. And I think that that was because they were painting and, and they weren't being, they, they were loving everything that they did as they, you know, they, every funny stroke that they were, creative stroke they would put in, they would fall in love with it. And it's this, they would build something up in their head. I don't know exactly what's going, what was going on. But that was the one type of person. The second type of person would call me up and they'd say, can you teach me how to paint? I wish I could paint like you, or I wish I could paint this realism that I love. And I'm not happy with my work. It's just horrible. I don't know what else to do to improve it. And they would come in and, and those people wouldn't bring their work to my studio. They'd leave it out in the car or whatever. And I'd say, can I see some of your paintings? And they would reluctantly show it to me. We'd walk out to the car and they'd pull it out. And in general, it was very good or, or much better than the people that thought they were good. And so there's this crazy you know, paradox where on the one hand, um, and, and maybe it's one of the reasons there are so few people that can really paint well. It's because you have to you know, somehow break through that and have enough passion to just keep painting and keep painting. And, and sort of accepting when people tell you, those people that you can trust, boy, your work is good. Um, and you just, you have to just work through it. And there's no easy way that I know of, but the artist curse is something that's very real and it stops so many people in their tracks uh, from painting further because they feel like they're not getting it when they really are getting it. And uh, so anyway, I just something that I wanted to talk about and bring to your attention, but um, that's the end of that lesson. Let's get into the questions. The thing I struggle with the most is getting my values right. I mostly work on medium value stained canvases, but I use pure white tear off palettes. What are your thoughts on how the color of your palette affects your painting and would you suggest investing in a neutral palette? I absolutely would. Um, you know, I've got a video that about how to make great artist palettes um, and we're about to make one on Geneva Fine Art and I'm absolutely going to balance the color of the palette so that it's a dead neutral color. And that means dead neutral not only in color, not only neutral yellow, blue, or red, meaning it's not doesn't have a shift to the red, doesn't have a shift to the yellow, doesn't have a shift to the blue. It's right in the middle. And then the value-wise from black to white, it's right in that sort of medium spot. Um, and that's really important. And I would not use white tear-off uh, palettes or any palette that's white. It absolutely will affect how you see the color. You can look right, uh, look at this color, and here it is on a neutral uh, palette. And then if you look at it on a white background, you can see how different it looks. And then again, on a black background, you can see how different it looks. So what I recommend is painting your canvas with the neutral color and painting your palettes with the neutral color so that there's, it really minimizes those effects, which are great. I mean, I think that if you're trying to paint dark colors on, and you've got a white palette, I mean, it's really hard to see and look at your dark colors and be able to judge them properly. I have the tendency of trying too many painting and drawing techniques, so it's hard to narrow down what style I want to pursue. Have you ever had this problem? If so, how have you disciplined yourself to, to stick to your method? Um, I really haven't had that problem too much. When I first started, it was really more about, I was changing my technique a little bit here and there, just trying to improve. You know, uh, when I first started, burnt, you know, burn umber will dry on your canvas in eight hours. And it used to drive me crazy that the burn umber would dry. So, you know, I read in Ralph Mayer's book, uh, The Artist's Guide to Materials and Techniques about oil of cloves. And so I changed my method a little bit. And then all of a sudden, you know, I had burn umber that would, would dry in, in a week, which was like a dream to me. Um, so, so that was some, but in terms of, you know, sticking to one method, I think that what you should do is, you know, be more goal oriented, perhaps. If you think about um, a great artist that you love or, or whatever concept or, you know, vision you have as an artist and you say, well, I would love to paint this painting. 
and, and don't hold back. I mean, if you know, if you if you want to paint, have an idea that you want to paint a, you know, big wooded scene with figures in it, or and you want it to be large or whatever, just the sky's the limit. You can do anything you want, but have a, an idea, and then do stick to the method that's going to get you there. And think about, in other words, instead of thinking about, oh, this is cool, the cool method, or that's, you know, I want to try that out, or whatever, think more about trying to create a masterpiece and using the method that's going to get you there. Um, you know, as far as my own teaching, there is a free course on drawmixpaint.com that has tons of content, videos, everything. And if you'll go through that course from the beginning to the end, absolutely will teach you to paint. Um, you know, I saw it over and over again. The people that would actually go through the course and do all the steps, their finished paintings were incredible. So I highly recommend doing that to, as far as learning to paint goes. But sticking to a method, I think you need to just think about, you know, what, what masterpiece you want to paint. And, and that's what I would do. How far should one sit from their shadow box? Is it simply a matter of comfort? Um, there's two things to consider when you're deciding how far away you're going to be from the subject. Uh, and in, in the case of a still life, what you would want to do is sort of mimic the distance that people will be looking at the finished painting from. In other words, if, you, if people typically stand, say, about four feet away from a painting hanging on a wall, then that would be the ideal uh, distance that you would want to be from the still life when you painted it. And the reason for that is because your perspective is, will change dramatically uh, depending on how close you are. If you're really close, you're going to see a, uh, you know, things are going to line up different than if you're really far away. And you just want it to be as close as possible to what naturally would happen if somebody were standing there looking at a still life sitting on a table. So I say about four feet. Um, the, the other thing to consider um, is that if you're, you want to really be as close as possible um, so that you can see detail better and you can, you can you know, zone in and see what you're looking at. Uh, if you're six feet away, you're going to have a hard time distinguishing some of the detail that you need to see. Um, that's the other uh, consideration. And four feet is, is about right, I think, for that. And then uh, one last consideration, and that is if you're working with a shadow box and you've got a roof sticking out, you don't want to be so close that the roof of the shadow box is casting a shadow on your color checker. So that's the other thing you need to consider. But four feet is about a good, a good uh, distance uh, for most. It's kind of a good happy medium and works out well. I think subject matter is a very important factor for painting realism, but it is hard to find something inspiring yet interesting in today's modern world. I was thinking of painting only still lifes for now and showing only still lifes in my first exhibition, mainly because I don't have access to great landscapes or portrait models. What are, what are your suggestions? Um, what I would suggest is, and you're absolutely right, I mean, getting good, especially, uh, I won't say especially, but with landscapes, um, you know, I've, that's something that's one of the hardest things to force. There's no easy way if you're going to be working from your own landscape photographs, you know, there's the golden hours in the morning and in the af late afternoon when the sun's kind of not straight overhead. And so if you're going to be a landscape um, photographer and you want to get good sources um, and you can wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning like every day for like a month and go out and take pictures, I mean, doing that kind of field work and uh, will we'll pay off, and that's the only way to do great landscapes, I think. I mean, you can always be driving down the road and just happen to see something or, you know, take a camera with you when you go backpacking, but if you really put in the effort and the hours and you get up and you film in those golden hours and you take, you know, 300 pictures a day, uh, that's how you get good landscape pictures. And then with portraits, Again, that's uh, maybe harder because of you know getting good models that'll work with you and sit with you. Uh, perhaps doing free portraits is one way to do it. Um, but you know if you want to keep the painting or or what one thing you could do is you could say, I, can I do your portrait and I'll give you the painting, uh, but let me keep it for three years so that I can use it for marketing or whatever. But uh, then the last thing as far as still lifes, that's exactly why people paint still lifes is uh, 
is just because you you know you don't need a, a model that's going to work with you or somebody to sit there and it's just always easy um, and so that's and, and also that as far as uh, working with a color checker a still life is really uh, much more controlled lighting so it's real easy to set up a still life and be able to do all your color checking and take all the time you need not feel pressed so I do highly recommend painting still lifes whether or not those are marketable it's going to be a lot of that's going to depend on just how good you are and whether your style matches what people are buying. But uh, yeah, I think Still Life's is a great way to go. And, and build a real nice shadow box. Um, you know, I've got a video on drawmixpaint.com about how to build shadow, uh, easy shadow box to build. It's not hard. Um, so consider doing that. Um, and having a great shadow box in your studio is wonderful because whenever you find time between two paintings, you can just, you know, set up a still life real quick and do a study and it keeps you uh, active and, and working and, there's no, and also this is one of the best things about uh, working still life is you can always work from life and you don't have to deal with the photographs and the laminating and everything else so to have a shadow box set up with a uh, you know ready to go to put still lifes in in your studio is a great asset as an artist I think. What size photos do you use when painting portraits? Um, I always paint uh, from photographs that are the exact same size as they're going to as it's going to be on the canvas. So you know I may not be able to make a print that's the size of my entire canvas, but everything is scaled to be exactly the same as it's going to be on the canvas. And I actually have a video that explains how to do that. It's an old video, but it's one um, it uses an old version of Photoshop, but it's exactly the same uh, workflow. And so go watch that video um, on, it's a free video on drawmixpaint.com about how to size your prints to be the same size as your uh, canvas, what you're going to paint. And that's way easier because you can imagine if you're working on a small, let's say your photograph, the head is this big, but then on the canvas it's this big. And then when you look at an eye and the eye on your photo is this big and you've got to decide how big to make that. And the only way that your brain can figure that is by taking into account you know all your penciling and the chins down here and the top of the heads here and now I've got to try to guesstimate how big my eye should be so that it's you know in the right scale for my painting but if your photographs the same size then you know when you look at the eye you know that your eye here needs to be exactly the same size and it makes the drawing much easier to keep everything in sync and to keep all your sizes relative to each other um, so that it, it, you know, matches up. So I highly recommend working from a photograph that's the exact same size as what you're going to uh, paint on your canvas. It's much easier. Um, and so that's what I recommend. The, the only thing about, you know, if you try to work from a small photograph, especially a really small photograph, and I see people doing this a lot, you know, they get a little snapshot and the head's this big and then they're trying to paint it this big. I mean, I personally, would I would have a much harder time working from a small photo like that and I have no doubt that it would affect the quality of my work like a lot so so it really makes a difference I'd like to know what you think about impressionism and painters like Monet and have you already tried oil painting in plain air with your method using the color checker and if so how did you use it with the sunlight um, First of all, I love Impressionism. I mean, there's, there's certain paintings that I really love, uh, especially uh, actually Monet's work is, you know, some of his work, I absolutely love it. Um, but that's really uh, for, you know, a matter of taste. Um, you know, in general, uh, I like the, the, the painters that paint like Sargent. And, you know, some people would say Sargent was Impressionistic uh, and he did some series of, uh, of paintings that would be impressionism, but that gets into isms and and you know there's trying to pigeonhole artists as one thing or another, and I can you know see certain impressionistic paintings that I absolutely love and that move me, but it's just not the method that I teach. Um, so that that's what I think about impressionism. But as far as uh, working with a color checker, plain air, uh, yes, I have uh, used a color checker painting plain air. It works fantastic. The only thing that you need to uh, concern yourself with is if you're doing any kind of sunset or any, any, any type of uh, sky where the, where the sky is the main subject and, and, and you're 
you know, for instance, in sunlight, or rather during a sunset or a sunrise, it's impossible to check the color because you're sitting here in the shadow, essentially, and you know, trying to match your colors to a bright sky that's off in the distance, and it just doesn't work. But in terms of sitting around a garden, you know, where the light is hitting you, it doesn't have to be direct sunlight. It can be indirect sunlight, or it can even be an overcast day. But as long as you're in the same amount of light that the subject is, you know, like sitting in a garden or, or whatever it is, um, but you'll still have to make sure that you, uh, you know, balance your whites, so to speak, meaning you can't be over underneath the tree shadow uh, trying to paint something out in the sunlight. It's not going to work. You're, you're going to have to put some white paint in your subject, put some white paint on your color checker, and match the, those two and get your values right and, and synced up uh, before you start. But other than that, it's just like painting a still life. Your limited palette consists of five colors that allow you to paint 99% of all the colors that exist in real life. The colors that you choose allow you to do so, but you avoid colors like cadmium red in your limited palette because they are so overpowering. Thomas Baker is another great artist on YouTube, and he uses six colors to make his color charts. Uh, so he uses strong colors in his limited palette. I know that both of you have a different methods of painting, but is there an advantage to using one palette over the other? You know, I, I don't want to say that there's an advantage to one over the other because it really depends on sort of your, you know, your whole working methods and, you know, how you go about mixing colors or whatever it is. Uh, so it's not as if there's one is better than another, but um, just from my own perspective and the way that I teach, um, I like my limited palette because it, it, you know, I don't like, for instance, I don't like to use thalo blue, uh, even though thalo blue is a wonderful, intense, strong blue color, but it's just overpowering and everything it gets into, it dominates. You know, once you get thalo blue on your brush, it's hard to get the color out. It's just too strong but I do use it um, when I have to use it. If I need a really strong turquoise blue, then I have to use thalo blue. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, ca cadmium red is also a little overpowering, but basically the five colors that I use, I like them because they have wonderful working properties. I like everything about the tint strength and the way that they, you know, mix together easily. Uh, and that just works for me. And, and as you said, that will get me to all the colors that I need 99% of the time. Um, and if I ever need a special power color, then I use cadmium red. And, I, and, and all these, these three colors we're actually going to be introducing into the Geneva um, art. You know, there's going to be three new colors that we have. And they are turquoise blue, which is a thalo blue and then a good, strong, bright cadmium red and uh, manganese uh, violet. And, and those three colors, in addition of the five, will pretty much get you to any color you can imagine, um, except for crazy fluorescent you know, black light colors or something. Well, that's it for this week's episode. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, be sure to tune in next week when I talk about some of the misconceptions about brushwork and working wet and wet. Thanks for watching.